everyone. My name is Farah Kassemi. I am a financial services partner here at IBM, and I have the pleasure of leading one of our big five team, big account teams on behalf of IBM Global Business Services. It is my honor to welcome you to today's session. This session is very close to my heart as a, as a professional, a Bay Street veteran, but also a big inclusion champion. This session is on the demo democratization, the word I always have a bit of a hard time pronouncing, of payments and financial inclusion using biometric digital identity, where we explore in more detail the case study of India. To present the session, I have my partner in all things payments in India, one of my favorite IBM partners, Akhil. Akhil, uh, we will uh, start with a presentation by you. And afterwards, I really look forward to us engaging in a bit of a fireside chat, a bit of a dialogue, uh, delving into a bit more detail on what you presented, and maybe even drawing some comparisons and, um, and connections between India and uh, here in Canada. So that's the plan for today. Uh, with that, I will pass it on to Akhil for you to introduce yourself and kick us off. Hey, thanks, Vera. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Akhil. I'm actually a partner for banking uh, based out of India. Uh, it's actually, as Farah was saying, uh, we've always worked together, and it's a pleasure to uh, do this session together and uh, talk a little bit about India as an innovation hub for payments uh, and uh, go beyond what's happening in India, uh, despite all the COVID and many other things. I just felt that uh, it's time to share something more positive about India, uh, what's happening here from a digital payments perspective, and all, of course, what are the future plans of how India is becoming a digital hub for payments, right? Um, so over to you, Farah. Let's just uh, quickly share a few perspective in terms of slides. And of course, then, uh, you know, I'm, I'm also looking forward to the fireside chat with you uh, where we can possibly exchange ideas and also take some questions from the audience, right? I mean, uh, that's the plan. Um, so let me just, uh, in the interest of time, uh, you know, uh, share a few slides first, Farah, and then uh, we move on to some of the questions that you and the audience will have. Yeah, so as uh, as, you was, as I was telling uh, you, Farah, before the session, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what was the key things when we talk about the India payment stack, uh, the biometric uh, ID, which is used in India, the unified payment interface, uh, what India has done from debit cards, uh, and also how are the platform plays disrupting the industry, the banking industry in India, right? Uh, so I'm going to cover all this and uh, feel free to stop and ask me a few questions uh, on any of the slides. And then, of course, we have the fireside chat, right? So just moving on. Um, so, uh, you know, when, when the government of India started this program, I think one of the fundamental things that they did right was to, you know, we, we, you know, Farah, we have more than 1.2 billion people, right? Uh, the, the government of India started this program of creating a digital identity, uh, a biometric identity for all our citizens, right? Uh, as you know, India has the educated public, and they also have people who can't read and write. So the government decided that one of the fundamental things that needs to be done is to create this biometric identity for every Indian, right? Uh, so my daughter uh, uh, took the first uh, biometric identity when she was just five years old. So after a certain stage, you know, everyone is enrolled in this, whether you're the rich, you're the poor, whether you're educated, non-educated, everybody has this digital identity. So today, as we speak, there is more than 1.24 people uh, who have this digital identity, right? And that is the wow. fundamental thing that the government did. The second thing that the government did was they said, look, we will open up a basic no frills account, which is a savings account for the poor across all the banks, right? The public sector banks, the state-owned banks did that first. And then the private sector also got in. So when we read about uh, CK Prala talking about the bottom of the pyramid, India is a live case study of that, right? How you can bring in the bottom of the pyramid in a society into the banking by creating a basic savings account, a no frills account for every single Indian, right? The third thing that happened while all this was happening, you know, Farah, they say data is the new oil. The telecom revolution just took off in India. 
And what it created was that the cost of data kept, came, kept coming down. And suddenly, the Indians who were supposed to go into a desktop, they just skipped that and completely migrated from a basic phone to what we call as a smartphone. They just skipped the desktop uh, part of it, which all other countries went through, and they just that just took off in India, right? So what it means is that there is more than 200 million active mobile users. So just imagine the penetration, the reach that internet has in India today, right? So every single person today, even if he's not able to afford all the three meals, is having a smartphone in his hand. And I must thank some of the Asian countries, uh, which actually revolutionized the smartphone market, market here, right? Uh, we have brands like Samsung and everyone else. So these three, the biometric identity, the no frill savings account opened by banks, and of course, the smartphone. And the fact that data is so cheap in India, was the one which actually set the ground for what we call as the most exciting part of a digital journey. So let me just move on, Farah, to just talk a little bit more about what were the catalysts of this, right? Because I think Canada and India started on this journey of instant payments almost together. But you know, one of the things that happened, you know, and they always say that a crisis creates a big innovation. You know, in 2016, the Prime Minister of India decided to demonetize a currency due to various reasons. And that actually spurred everyone to adopt digital payments because there was no choice. Cash was not available when they demonetized currency. The second thing that the government did was that having opened all the accounts for the poor, etc., they said all subsidies, all welfare measures will now go through the banking network. Now the government did that to eliminate corruption, right? There was no middleman and they said, look, if you are supposed to get a dole, you will get it directly into your bank account. And that really revolutionized. So every poor guy who had to get a subsidy from the government, had to get a payment from the government, had to now have a bank account and he had to open it up quickly. Right. And then, you know, the with the help of your biometric identity, there was no way somebody else could take that money away from you. Right. And that is the beauty of it. That is what spurred this financial inclusion. And then, like I said, the cost of data became cheaper, which means that everybody could afford a smartphone, right? And so all these six, seven factors really leap forward and set the stage to nearly creating, you know, more than 3 billion transactions of payments today go through the India banking system. Now, you might be wondering, Farah, right? Uh, India, with 1.2 billion population, is actually processing 3 billion payments a month, right? Which goes through this infrastructure. So what is that organization behind it, right? I mean, I'm, I'm sure you must be very curious. So I just want to show you which is that. I mean, so the organization behind it is something called NPCI, right? So the organization called NPCI was actually set up in 2020 by the government of India, which actually is owned by six banks. It has the private sector banks, and the public sector banks coming together along with the government to create what is called the National Payments Center for India, which is NPCI, right? This was created to basically create this digital infrastructure, right? So along with this biometric identity, they've also created a low cost debit card and a low cost credit card, which can be used by the poor, right? So MasterCard and Visa are still being used, but this more than 1 billion cards are there in India, which is called the RU Pay. They've created this biometric enabled payment system. They've also created what is called a Beam app, which is a very user friendly app by which a customer can initiate a payment from a smartphone. Now, just imagine Farah, right? When you talk about 3 billion transactions, the first thing that keeps comes in your mind, how do you prevent fraud? Right? How do you prevent the merchant from you know, uh, creating a fraudulent transaction? The Beam app is initiated from your smartphone, is helping us to give get consent from the customer. And that's and, and it is so beautifully designed, that is so user friendly that it is used in a very ubiquitous manner by everybody, right? And it and it, it became in such a way that uh, you know, everyone uh, started using it in a very friendly manner, right? So 
you can see uh, you know a lot of things which uh, NPCA has innovated. The other thing that I want to talk is about the usage of QR codes, right? NPCI created a standard QR code mechanism which will be used by all payment wallets. So instead of using a POS, instead of using a credit card, all you are using is an app on your smartphone where you scan the QR code and you're able to send payments or receive payments across different banking entities. And the other thing which is uh, very important, Farah, which I want to highlight to you is what is being exchanged is a virtual ID which internally is mapped to an account number. So the account numbers are not physically exchanged, but what is exchanged is just virtual IDs. So you are making sure that the UPI, which is a unified payment interface, is so safe and secure, right? And it is running on the back end on a national switch created, which all the banks have in terms of a ATM switch. So the moment you get through the national switch, you hit the bank servers, then you are within the bank systems where you run on the ATM network of the bank. So the system has been designed in a way that's very resilient, it's very safe, and it's very easy to use. And it is also kept with a virtual ID so that there is no fraud, right? So because of these features, Farah, you know, it, it quickly helped in adopting, not just across public sector banks, but also the private sector, right? So let me just move on, Farah, in the interest of time, but I'm sure you must be seeing a lot of things. I saw you making notes, I'm sure that there are some things which you will find this very useful for Canada also. I love that you, I mean, just the term leapfrog, you've taken it to a whole other level with this story. So I can't wait for you to keep telling us more because I think there, are, I know we've all heard about the story of India in different facets and different forms, but when you lay it out all out in one go, kind of a bit sequentially, I love it. I love it. It's just got, it's full of inspiration for all of us. So anyway, I just wanted to say that, but continue. Sure. Thanks for that. Yeah. So Farah, as I was saying, uh, you know, the, the other beauty of it is people who still don't have a smartphone, the ability to do unstructured supplement service data, which means that you, with a basic uh, phone, you don't have a smartphone, you can still do funds transfer get your banking balance. That's what this USDD is talking about. So like I said, uh, biometric enabled payments, the unified payment interface, micro ATMs, uh, replacing it with the QR code, uh, having prepaid cards, which are debit cards and credit cards, which is called RUPay. Everything was done by NBCA, right? In a matter of a few years. So let me just move on. Uh, this is a fact about the simplicity of what we call is the beam app which is the indian mobile payment app which helps you to do uh, this funds transfer in a very seamless way um, like i was telling you all that is exchanged is virtual ids mapped to your mobile number so your account number is safe and uh, of course this app can also use can be used to scan a qr code and then it can do push and pull payments so as long as you take consent of the customer the ability of a merchant to do a fraud, right? Because there is a big section of our public who do not know how to read and write. So the government has designed this in a way that there is no way a fraud can happen, right? So that's the beauty of the system, which can work for everybody, right? Uh, right from the top of the pyramid to the bottom of the pyramid. So just moving on, right? And, and if I were to look back on this journey for her, right? Uh, we talked about a lot of factors and saying, but I just thought I'd like to summarize uh, a few things about how they did it. So one of the things that NPCA did was they studied global systems, right? They looked at what worked for faster payments in UK. They also looked at Africa, which is an emerging continent with a lot of emerging economy with similar uh, socio uh, structures, similar to uh, uh, India. And they looked at what Kenya had done from a payments perspective, right? And the other thing here, uh, uh, what happened in Kenya was how the telecom companies got into the payment space in Kenya and how uh, Vodafone and Airtel created what is called the Empesa to disrupt payments, right? They actually studied all that to look at what can be taken and success transferred to India. And they still adapted it to some of the local things that are available, right? Because if you look at UK and others, they don't have a biometric identity. But India had to do that, right? So it was about thinking global and acting local, right? I mean, that was a, the second thing that NPCA did was 
the fact that it was formed with a partnership of private sector banks and public sector banks, it was always a, a set of trust between the banks, collaboration between the banks, and the ability to do pilots and uh, small innovative cycles of iteration. So that, you know, there is a lot of trust with the participants. And every time, uh, you know, you do a pilot, you take those lessons learned, and that's how they've been able to uh, scale it up so quickly because the fundamental trust was always there. The other thing which I was saying is that the way they have designed the B map is all about a day in the life of a person, right? So, for example, when the demonetization happened, my vegetable vendor who came to supply vegetables said, why don't you use the Google Pay and transfer money to me? Why don't you use a mobile wallet and transfer? Just imagine that if you're able to make this app so user friendly to a vegetable vendor and a flower vendor, imagine how the middle class and the rich can adapt that, right? So the way you have designed it is, as we say, a customer journey led approach. Today in a bank, you go and talk to the CIO say, we need to transform customer journeys. They did it at scale so that everyone can use the app in, in terms of simplicity, in terms of a day in a life so that every need of yours, whether it is bill payments, whether it is, uh, you know, payments to your mom sitting in a village, everything can be done seamlessly. The second thing which I think banks, the private sector banks adopted it was uh, the fact that it was frugal innovation delivered at such a low cost that a bank could not create a competitive structure which could match it, right? The, the, the cost of setting a payment or a funds transfer is so cheap that everybody decided to adopt the same payment infrastructure, which I think is a very key thing, right? It's not enough to innovate, but how do you deliver it at scale at such a cheap cost, right? I mean, that's very important. So today as we speak, uh, Farah, there's a lot of resiliency, anti-fraud mechanism, and things uh, where the failure rate is so less, right? Um, and, and the banks obviously have to keep upgrading their infrastructure to catch with the volumes of transaction going. So when we talk in COVID times as contactless payments, it already has happened in India four years back. And the COVID has just accelerated the shift to digital, right? We did demonetization four years back, five years back, and we had to adopt digital. So when COVID came, one thing that had never uh, changed in India was we were already on this uh, unified payment interface. So for us, doing contactless payments was something that is business as usual, right? The other thing which I think is very important is that the regulator was also in this where there was a balance between innovation, progress, and caution. So that was the other thing that, uh, you know, there was a lot of trust uh, and the fact that the regula regulator also backed this, right? Uh, so that uh, as you continue to look at data, because the data is still owned by the banks, right? All that NPCA does is to create this framework and help in quick exchange of payments. The last but not the least, uh, Farah, is the other things that the central organization is planning to look at remittances and the other things. So what I can see here, Farah, is telecom giants in India getting into payments, telecom giants in India getting into banking. So, you know, unlike Canada, where there are four or five large banks, here, Farah, it's intensely banked, right? You have private sector banks, public sector banks, and today, we are on the cusp of seeing a lot more fintechs and a lot more telecom companies all getting into banking. So it's it's really a very exciting uh, next set of five years that we're going to see, Farah, right? I can go on and on, but I'm sure, Farah, you will have a lot more questions to ask from a Canadian perspective. So let me just move on, right? So Farah, what has it created, right, in the last five years? This ubiquitous payment network has set the stage to say that, yes, I'm a poor poor nation, but today I'm a data rich nation. And it's a, with a lot of pride I'm saying that, right? From a data poor nation, we become a data rich nation. And that is very, very transformation as far as India is concerned. Because what it creates is that I can create a platform for giving us frictionless credit. I have a platform today for giving frictionless payments. I'm now setting a stage for doing a frictionless credit. What it means for us, like as we get out of COVID in a couple of months, the entire set of structure, I mean, the, the, the banked population and the unbanked population, all will need access to credit. 
the the formalized economy and the informal economy all need credit the banks have been capitalized and they need to now deliver this credit in order for india to go back to 11% uh, 12% growth and this has to happen in a digital way we cannot be again going back to the traditional ways of banking and this is what i wanted to say as the next big thing that we are in cusp so what we are seeing now is what the government had been planning for the last one year which is about open credit network for us as you are on the cusp uh, you know india is already on the cusp of open banking we've done digital payments so what it means for us is as long as i give a consent to my bank to share data as long as i give consent to my financial information provider to give data then a financial information user is a person who is willing to give me credit will get access to the data and what it means is that where do i bank where do i spend money how much i am spending on my credit card do i have a mortgage loan all that data is going to be shared across banks and that means for um, where india has such a large informal economy which means that there are many people who may not be have a, having a regular salaried income but who have a large business community they are going to get access to credit the poor of india the flower vendor and the vegetable vendor whom i was talking to you is going to get access to credit and what it means is a very very big platform play which we are already seeing in india right so india is on the cusp of a dramatic credit revolution so as you can see uh, for uh, along with all this that the government did on the india digital stack it is also revolutionizing how quickly you you can open banking account how quickly you can get a, a telecom sim card uh, how quickly you can have an investment account right so you can see this from hours to days to minutes all that has happened because of the, the biometric digital stack that the government created right you can also store all your documents which you give for kyc in a digital locker so what it mean is you have a unique id you give that id and your the financial institution will be able to access your digital locker and get your documents so which means that every time you apply for a product you don't need to give the same kyc documents again so a by product of the digital stack of india means that you're not just talking about payments you're not just talking about credit but the entire onboarding process which i know that in canada you guys are trying to streamline across many banks we have simplified it today right um just uh, you know so so what this means you know and again for the other beauty of it is uh, you know if you look at google play if you look at facebook which is launching uh, whatsapp payments everyone is going to ride on this unified payment interface google google actually processes more than 25 million transactions they actually took this example of what india has done as a digital tax to the fed and said look this is what we are doing in india why can't us be like this right so it was a very proud moment for india where uh, google showcased what they call as frugal innovation what has happened in india to the fed to say look this is what us should do right so uh, it's a very uh, interesting thing and i also wanted to talk about the uno platform that ibm has designed for sbi which is a largest marketplace uh, where you you can buy a shoe you can book your travel and all that you're able to do that because of this ubiquitous payment platform behind which is which is creating this large canvas for uh, state bank of india to access 400 million customers uh, in this uh, and move them into this digital platform right and the other interesting thing for us is what reliance is doing so reliance is now created it's a telecom company it's actually an oil and gas major is a fourth richest man in the world and he is now creating this digital platform with facebook and google and you can see uh, all the top investment banks all in one single stack right so you know it's a telecom company which is now going to become you can say the alibaba of india right so th there are so many interesting things that are being bundled into this telecom stack uh, and you can see a lot of familiar names right so as we speak there are many many large conglomerates who are now getting their act together to create what we call a super app right a super app which can straddle across telecom and financial services which can create this cross industry convergence across retail uh, across um, uh, you know uh, telecom across financial services 
And that's what Geo is trying to do. Uh, like I said, you know, this thing, and this is what is going to come to Canada also as you continue to implement real time payments. But that's uh, something that I'm sure uh, you will have a lot to talk. But Farah, I, I hope this conversation was interesting. I know I went through a lot of things and uh, threw a lot of jargons on you, but I just felt like, you know, uh, during this COVID time uh, in the Payments Canada conference, I wanted to showcase something good of what India has done. And what India is planning to do. And I just felt that uh, this should be shared across the world. Uh, uh, and to say that this is what is going to come as a disruption in other emerging markets also. So what do you think, Farah? Wow. I uh, Wow is the word that I can use to kind of uh, show you as my reaction to everything you just said. Akil, um, I love, love, love the, the story. And you're a great storyteller. You know this. I've said this to you many, many times before. I love that you presented that the India story with so much passion. And there were so many elements of it. I was taking notes where I think we as Canadian uh, payments professionals, uh, bankers can really learn from and just get inspired by. Not only did you touch upon inclusion, you touched, touched upon digital identity, fraud prevention, security and resilience, data richness, you know, truly owning your data, utilizing it to get better, uh, bringing along the unbanked and the uncredited, even children, as you talked about your five-year-old, I have an almost five-year-old and I can't even imagine getting there, hopefully soon, but right now we're not there yet, right? And, and you also talked about platforms and ecosystems, but you know, on steroids, like this, all this really, really resonated with me. And, and you know, Akhil, I'm, I'm half South Asian and, and half Middle Eastern, and I see the advantages that countries that we're from have as they're leapfrogging and they don't have the legacy infrastructures to deal with, which sometimes really works to your benefit, right? And I know India was a bit of both. Um, you had a bit of that, but you also had the opportunity to leapfrog. And, and you know, I, I was in the UK, I was working in the UK when that region was going through payments modernization. So anyway, all your story just brought so many light bulbs for me that I really hope our audience also uses. And, and I know none of this is is um you know revolutionary and we haven't heard it obviously we've all heard these stories before but it's always good to kind of ground ourselves and hear it all in one go and and at minimum use it as inspiration as we're all going through our individual journeys trying to make uh move the dial a little bit move the needle on the payments um, uh, journey that Canada is going through um so anyway i i all of that really so resonated that actually, with I, I, yeah, so Farah, I was actually trying to, I know we discussed, I, think, I was just thinking that what are the three, four things that you feel will be very relevant for Canada from what we have talked, right? Obviously, India is possibly a couple of years ahead, um, you know, and there's more uh, to learn for other countries. So what do you think are the top two, three things that you feel that will impact Canada or, or what you can call as lessons learned or success factors that you feel, um, you know, as a lead account partner for a leading bank, uh, you feel that, okay, Akhil, I, I'm planning to think of these two. So what would that be, uh, Farah? Um, very good question. I was kind of taking notes as I was, as I said, as you were talking. And, and for me, there are about two or three things. Number one, I think the welfare programs, you know, that we are now looking at and we were kind of forced into through the pandemic to look at by the government. And I know all the banks came together overnight and, and worked together to bring about financial inclusion in light of the pandemic. But I think there is still so much for us to learn. And the India story really takes that a few steps further. And, and we can really take that, especially in the in the worlds that we live in, where things like a pandemic are not far fetched ideas. I think that that was a number one lesson for me. Number two, um, you know, as you were talking and you were talking about convergence amongst the different industries, even not just amongst different players in the same industry, but amongst the different industries. So your, your examples about telecom and financial services uh, industries coming together, you know, we all know telecom companies are 
finding their way into banking. And what I what's keeping me up at night, and I know I'm sure what's keeping up my clients at night is the further disruption that's being created in in this industry by what we call outsiders. Um, so there's a real opportunity for the industries to come together and work together because if you can't beat them, you may as well join them, right? It's the whole concept Absolutely. of the systems. Um, and there was one other point though, because there's a lot, I took a lot of notes, but the third point, which is equally big and important for me is, I loved the term frugal in innovation that you used, right? And, um, and, and as volumes have increased, India has managed to keep uh, your costs lower, right? And I'm a big fan of the systems, as I mentioned, and, and the sharing of the learning, learnings, regardless of the diversity of the different players, your story talked about, you know, big established banks, but also the small up and coming startups and the Google pays of the world, everyone, right? So I think, um, you know, the way when I kind of bring it back to Canada for me is, you know, we as IBM, um, you know, we're, we're continuing to invest in this space too. And, and uh, it, it's, it's pretty well known, the Canadian, um, uh, you know, credit unions are working with IBM now. And, and uh, we actually, in even serving our own clients, we came up with some very, very interesting commercial models, you know, going back to the whole phrase of frugal innovation. And I think we really did use India uh, you know, use some of our learnings that came from India when we were coming up with those, you know, CapEx to um, OpEx models. And none of this, you know, just kind of taking a step back as we all hear from you about what you're saying, it's never a simple lift and shift. It's a bit of a lift, tailor and implement. And I think, um, and, and, you know, this third point also brings me back a little bit to the financial inclusion point we were talking about because credit unions are a big player there. So anyway, I kind of went around in circles, but those but are my uh, topics. Uh, while, while you're talking, I'm, I'm just remembering that uh, the fact that whatever you design in payments should be like a day in a life of you, right? So that it is used ubiquitously, the interoperability is there, right? So I think that from a Canadian perspective, uh, from the time I uh, order my coffee in Starbucks to uh, you know, uh, buy uh, groceries to buy or gift for somebody. Uh, it should the the payment app should be so easy to, easy to use, and I should be able to share the expense. Um, so I think uh, you've been always talking about uh, the you know how your apps should be designed so well. And Farah, you're an expert in digital transformation, so I knew that that is the other thing that you will like a lot uh, in terms of impact. Um, uh, which I think is uh, right. important, right? Uh, uh, and I think I, I always uh, uh, look forward to uh, the, the ways that you've done digital transformation, uh, which again uh, is something that I take back to my clients in India about uh, that fact. Um, uh, so I, I guess it is uh, uh, very interesting uh, to hear you talk about some of those points. Um, so what next, uh, Farah? I mean, what else would you like to hear uh, from me? Uh, uh, you know, we've been talking, but uh, what else would you like to hear from me? Sure, sure. I, I'm not done yet. I've got at least two or three more questions for you. But, sure. um, you know, one of the things you talked about was frictionless credit. And I know you touched upon it quite a bit, but, um, and, and it's obviously being revolutionized all over the world. Tell me more about what's the latest in India above and beyond what you just covered in your presentation. Yeah, I think uh, so far, I think uh, uh, this uh, we are in the stage of launching this open credit program. Right. And what it means is that uh, uh, your ability to monetize the payment data in terms of structured and unstructured use things like uh, you know, the latest AI ML technology to look at all the digital footprints that you will leave both on the structured and unstructured media and the ability to synthesize the data and then ability to offer you better credit terms. Because uh, unlike the West, there are a lot of people in the informal economy in India who are still, uh, you know, uh, have a lot of income, but their tax returns may not uh, be showing that, right? So how do you capture that market of advancing credit to them? And how do you ensure that they also come back into the formal economy? 
right? Uh, with the demonetization, with COVID, we are seeing this increasingly the formal sector uh, consolidating more. What it means is the small and medium enterprises uh, is that group of people who are actually plumbing the economy of the country need access to cheaper, faster credit, right? And it is that market that the banks also are going after. And also the poor of India will also need to be uplifted as India goes through this journey of trying to get to 11% GDP growth and a trillion dollar economy, right? These are the lofty ideals that the prime minister has said. So in order to do that, access to credit in a seamless manner is such a fundamental thing for us. And I'm going to see this also coming to Canada as you launch open banking, as you launch instant, the banks which are today dominating in Canada will then see this disruption happening. So you are also going to see the same disruption that is going to happen on the credit side, like in India, going to come there further. So that brings me to, uh, to like you talked about, uh, so I don't know about Canada, whether you are also seeing a similar uh, set of threats, or you can say uh, the concepts of universal bank will start seeing the modes that they've built. Uh, I, I see that that's going to get disrupted for What do you think of what I'm saying? Absolutely. I completely agree with you. Now that we're seeing the light at the end of the pandemic tunnel, uh, the whole robust universal banking, I think, will become more needed. I'm not going to lie. I tried using my credit card last week and I'd forgotten my pin because I haven't used my credit card, you know, the tangible credit card in so long. I've just been using things online where they've saved my credit card info. So it was a big jolt for me that I'm now starting to get back out there and, and the demand for credit is coming back now. Right. And, and, you know, you talked about kind of structured and unstructured lending and how, you know, the world is opening up. And now uh, to me, this is, this is opportunity, right? All of this is opportunity because especially can in Canada, banks are already on their payments, modernization and open banking journeys. And, and we can really use that and the fact that the world has now changed uh, due to the pandemic, we can take a bit of a leadership position rather than have it happen to us, right? Um, especially as it relates to the unbanked and, and the uncredited. So I think, you know, in our journey to instant credit, the Canadian banks can take a, a leadership role here. And there are a lot of lessons learned uh, from your story that we can we can bring home here and and use the times and the opportunity that's bubbling up for us to uh, you know to pivot essentially. Correct, correct. That's so, the right word. Um, uh, yeah, no, no, absolutely. We're all we're all about pivoting these days. But um, you know, Akil, again, you asked me what other questions I have. At least I have, I have a, a couple more questions, but. Um, you know, another element of your story that really resonated with me was um, MPCI and the, the, the trust of the banks um, that it won. Like, how did how did MPCI gain the trust of the banks, especially the private banks, to adopt technology and all that innovation that you talked about? But also keeping in mind security and fraud prevention. You know, you, you talked about the acceleration of the shift to digital when you were presenting. So can you tell me a little bit more about that? I would like to kind of peel that onion a bit more and understand how MPCI was able to gain that trust from the players. Yeah, so for other, I think there were three, four factors. One is that NPCI itself was founded by private sector and public sector together. There are six or seven banks which own it, right? Uh, the second thing was uh, when NPCI designed the payment app, they, the, like I said, all that is exchanged is virtual IDs and your mobile number. So in from a fraud sense, literally, the, the, when you if you were to hack into the network, you're not going to get much, right? Because what is exchanged is a virtual ID and a mobile number. And what they've also done is because they've asked the consent to be given from the customer end, which means that you can't fiddle out with a POS device. Everything is on a customer's phone. And the customer is uh, uh, giving the consent for a payment to be received. It was designed in such a 
beautiful manner in a very simplistic way that the banks also felt that this design is something that is ubiquitous easy to use and they started finding a lot of customers adopting it right and then you know like we say that once the innovation takes off the volumes as i said today we do 3 million payments a month right so as more people adopted it the banks realized that if you don't take up this you're going to miss the boat and the banks also realized that you're delivering this innovation at such a low cost price that there was no incentive for the bank to recreate a payment infrastructure and all that right so so that is what uh, is this although now having seen this 3 billion transactions etc now the regulator has said maybe we should create one more organization like npci because we don't want npci to be a single point of failure so there is a proposal by the government maybe once covid is over there will be other organizations created so that there are more innovations coming right so that's the role of the regulator also which i want to appreciate which actually spurred innovation with caution but kept looking at you know what's happening in uk what's happening in africa and marrying what we call global practices and adapting it to local conditions so i think all these factors uh, for uh, really helped in developing the trust of the banks and the fact that you did it in an iterative way took feedback and they i mean it's not that it was a everything was seamless i'm sure there would have been some failure rates which uh, they actually changed right i think uh, there are things that npc has to do more uh, while looking at hybrid cloud and a lot of new stuff that they have to do which i'm sure uh, will be an interesting thing for all of us to look at yeah that's that's a very good point as you were talking i was kind of having uh, deja vu from my conversations with my clients about these topics and you're so right um i think all of those uh enablers and incentives really helped uh bring bring about the banks uh, to the table as you're talking about it you know when i look back at the uh, five key modernization pillars that payments canada launched as part of its vision several years ago two two of them that are, i think really apply to what you're talking about are um, open risk-based access and 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 the second one is data rich payments and i think um you know and, and i'm sure all of our audience knows this but who for the for the few who may not may not know open risk-based um, access it's basically payments canada and bank of canada working towards opening access but in a very risk-based fashion to third-party service providers, fintechs, non-bank FIs, allowing them to transact while ensuring, this is really important, the safety and soundness of, of the system and of the country. And, um, and data-rich payments is uh, the standardization of rich data. You know, we talk about data all the time. It's the better operability and automation and and it all causes efficiencies across the different systems. And the other thing is, you know, Bank of Canada, um, in addition to high value and low value payments, is, is also now a, a regulator of retail payment systems. And I think this further ensures ubiquity of system of the system overall, while, as I said, ensuring safety, soundness, and resilience. And I think all this will allow the banks to pivot, adapt not fall behind in this brave new world of disruption that we're living in, right? Um, so anyway, I, I, as, as you're talking, I keep thinking about the linkages to Canada and, and the world and the life that I live. Um, Akil, I know we've been talking for quite a bit, but I, I want to try and wrap, the, wrap this up in the next few minutes. Uh, so maybe we'll just get to one or two more questions. Um, but, you know, thinking about growth, future expansion outside India. What will, and, and you touched upon this a little bit as you were talking there, what do you think um, NPCI will do next? I think uh, it's a very interesting thing, Farah, because NPCI has now created what is called an NPCI International, right? So what they realized was there's a large diaspora of Indians living across the world, right? These Indians also travel uh, to different places. Before COVID, uh, we were all traveling spending money. So what NPC International is dreaming is to do two things. One is they want to disrupt the remittance market, right? Today, uh, the diaspora of uh, Indians living across the world are actually sending remittances to India, which also is very important from a growth perspective of India. 
and today they use the traditional banking network. So what NPCA is looking at is to create a parallel remittance framework so that the cost of transfer of funds would be far low cheaper, like the way they've created a payment network in India, they want to create an international payments network. The other thing they also want to do is to, the, the RU Pay, which is their local debit and credit card that we created, they want to make sure that you can use that internationally. So which means that they're also thinking of disrupting the market of credit cards, which Visa and Master are dominating. Now, these are all things that those are plans. So I think uh, from a remittance perspective, when I think about it, Farah, I mean, you, you also have a lot of remittance traffic between Canada and the US, and of course, a lot more countries uh, who are a part of the Commonwealth. So I remember, uh, you know, IBM buying this beautiful company called Expiritus. So do you want to share that to uh, the larger audience here? I mean, how Expiritus is a key to IBM's success in remittance and payments. Sure, sure. I mean, as you were talking about kind of MPCI going global, I again, before I get there, to me, as I was having the connections to, to Canada point, you know, US and Canada, they are the biggest trade partners, but with our diverse metropolitan cities structure where there's such, such a big immigrant population with so many linkages to countries all around the world, I think there's absolutely an opportunity for us here too, for us to learn again, as, as you have your sites uh, internationally so much, how we can do that too. And, and, you know, payments is being transformed and IBM has a big role to play, right? Like you and I are at IBM and we're seeing it. And I think it's, um, there's, there's two things here. It's absolutely our recent acquisition of, of Expertis, uh, which again is very close to my heart, but also our payments as a platform service, um, uh, payments as a service platform. And, and both of them would really help with that cross-border frictionless that we're talking about with PaaS. It's, um, it, you know, there's cross-border rails, frictionless, seamless, low cost, and all rails are covered, right? Even the transfer-wise earth ports of the world across the different jurisdictions. And then going back to Expertus, you know, we've got two main, uh, two main offerings there. Um, and the first one is the SWIFT Service Bureau, which is positioned to support cross-border payments. SWIFT where, uh, based primarily it's for wires or ACS transactions. Um, and it's a SaaS solution, and we're we're looking at offering this in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, but also, secondly, you know, we have a wire room and an engine. It's called the Expertus Payment Service (EPS), and it's actually recently gone live um, with the Canadian credit uh, credit unions as an integrated payments engine. So, uh, you know, kind of bringing it back to Canada, but also our lives at IBM, where we're trying to make a difference. To me. You know, those are some of the offerings that I think can further help with opening up the world and, and facilitating Absolutely. that cross-border collaboration. Very good. Uh, Farah, in fact, uh, I also wanted to say that uh, IBM helped the Saudi economy to go live on uh, instant payments and real-time payments, right? And there, uh, I was just talking to Sridhar, who is uh, a part of our team. Uh, he was saying that, you know, they have looked at international remittances using blockchain technology. So, you know, uh, the more we see different countries go into instant payments, real-time payments, international wires, um, I feel very happy that uh, IBM is that global organization uh, where we have this unique ability to bring successful implementation, success factors across the world to every single uh, bank or every single central bank, which is on the cusp of implementing that, right? Um, so it's been a, a great pleasure, uh, Farah, talking to you and uh, having this exchange of ideas about what's happening in Canada, what's happening in India, and what's happening uh, in Saudi, right? So it's it's really great. Uh, uh, so I guess uh, we both have been chatting. I'm sure the audience will have a lot more questions to ask us. Uh, I'm sure I see a lot of uh, questions on the chat. Uh, so maybe we should spend the last uh, five, 10 minutes um, to possibly answer some of the questions in the chat. and. Uh, and uh, thank you again, uh, Farah. It's been a very pleasant afternoon to me. Uh, and I'm looking forward to many more such sessions with you where we chat about uh, things happening across the world in banking.
Yeah, I know. And and honestly, Akil, this was, I've heard you speak many, many times before and you and I've had these discussions so many times before, whether with our clients or in preparation for client conversations. But this session for me, again, still was such a big source of inspiration. There are so many lessons learned for us here in Canada. The world is only getting smaller. And I think there's, there's a lot we can all do as Canadian banks, as IBM, to, to facilitate that innovation, that, uh, that you know, using um, some of these events as opportunity to move forward, uh, financial inclusion, it's huge. So thank you for all of that inspiration and that discussion. I know I joined IBM a few weeks before the lockdown, so we haven't met yet in person, even though it feels like I've known you for years. And I can't wait when we can all start traveling again and I can come see you in India and we can explore some of these themes even more in person with our clients. Absolutely. Absolutely. Looking forward to that day. So stay safe, Farah, and stay safe to everyone else uh, who's a part of the audience. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. You too. You too. Take care of yourself, your family, your, your networks, your communities. Thank you. Our hearts are with you. Our prayers are with you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.